Hello beautiful bookworms, Squirrely Nerdy Jess here, and today I wanted to share with you five books that literally changed my life. So the five non-fiction books I have picked out have indeed changed my life. They've changed the way I think and the way I act, or at least they have influenced how I try to behave since reading them. I don't always succeed in fairness, but nevertheless, I suspect that the world would be a better place if everyone in the world read these five books. Not perfect, of course, but better. Hint, audiobooks are your friend. Starting with the one I most recently read, Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention by Johan Hari. I've mentioned this on my channel before, including in my 2023 reading wrap-up, but this was an incredibly well-researched and well-articulated book about different studies concerning focus and attention. We tend to think of attention problems occurring with younger generations, but even as we age and as more damaging technological experiences encroach into our lives, we probably all feel to some extent that our focus and attention span is getting worse. This book not only explains why that may be, looking at different angles of the problem, but it also provides some hope and direction as to what may be done to help. One big change I've made in my life as a result of this book, intentionally focusing on monotasking rather than multitasking. Multitasking is a myth. The term was invented in the context of computer processing and was never meant to be applied to human brains. The vast majority of people's brains simply are not capable of true multitasking and instead simply switch between tasks very, very quickly. However, this constant switching means we waste brain processing time having to remember what we were doing before, we inevitably make more mistakes and therefore waste time correcting errors, we experience a creativity drain by not allowing ourselves free and undistracted time where our brains best make new connections and innovations, and it becomes harder to remember and learn what you've completed when you multitask. This is why distracted driving is now responsible for one in five accidents, a similar level to the impairment of driving drunk. What I've worked on implementing as a result is taking intentional time to monotask with no distractions, but I'll admit I struggle with this. Whether it's because I was raised in capitalist America or because I'm naturally an overproductive person, my brain seems inherently geared for efficiency and I feel, however falsely, that the only way to get everything done is to multitask. What that meant was, though, say I wanted to sit down for an hour and read a book. I found it very difficult to dedicate my attention for an entire hour, even if it were a book I was really enjoying. And it wasn't just reading. I felt restless every time I wasn't doing multiple things at once, feeling the constant pull of, what else can I do? So you start small, say 10 minutes, put all devices away and just allow yourself to fully concentrate on one task. Gradually, you can increase the time to 15 minutes, 20, 30, an hour. This will work your brain like a muscle, strengthening the neural connections involved. With reading specifically, I found this really helped me, but that's just one small part of this book. It also dives into flow states, when we become so comfortably engrossed in a task that we lose all sense of time and just flow through it. It discusses physical and mental exhaustion, why long form storytelling like books or shows with multi-season arcs makes us more empathetic than short form content like films, the benefit of letting your mind wander, the rise of ADHD and our cultural response to it, and of course, the massive problem that is social media and addiction to screens, a lot of which has to do with the economic model companies used and how they are intentionally geared towards monopolizing our attention. The Netflix documentary The Social Dilemma addresses this last problem extremely well if you want to first watch that. Some of the people in that documentary are in fact also featured in this book. So to better understand from a psychological standpoint why you might be finding it hard to focus and to learn how you may be able to improve your focus whilst not blaming yourself for succumbing to the intentionally manipulative tactics, I highly recommend Stolen Focus. Second, another book I have mentioned before on this channel, Talking to Strangers, What We Should Know About the People We Don't Know by Malcolm Gladwell. I've said it before and I'll say it again, this is a very good one to read via audiobook on Audible. It is read by the author himself who is a great narrator in his own right, 
but it also is enhanced with actual sound clippings from events mentioned and even its own theme song. But essentially, this book is about communication and miscommunication across languages, cultures, and media, which tools and strategies we use based on our own life experience to make sense of people we don't know, and how assumptions and misunderstandings can lead to catastrophic events. Gladwell uses various tales from history, such as the trial of Amanda Knox, the investigation of Bernie Madoff, the suicide of Sylvia Plath, and many more, and looks at each one in depth. I found the Amanda Knox bit particularly intriguing, as so many thought she was guilty of murder just because she didn't act the way most people expected someone to act in that situation, despite the lack of any evidence at all of her guilt. I've already put a lot of work into myself to be a person who really makes an effort to see things from different angles, to psychologically walk a mile in someone else's shoes, and this book exposed just how much I didn't know that I didn't know. I genuinely believe if every person in the world could read this book, maybe, just maybe, we may be able to coexist with each other a little better. Next up, The Demon Haunted World by Carl Sagan. Around my mid-twenties, I read a lot of books which contributed to making me the person I am today, in as far as becoming a skeptical and critical thinker. And if I had to pick one of those to recommend to best represent the lot, it would be this. I have both read this in physical and audiobook form, by the way. This book is ideal for anyone who doesn't quite understand or trust the field of science, as it explains in detail exactly why scientific thinking is the best system for understanding the universe. It discusses science's built-in error correction mechanisms and explains why science's explanations are more beautiful and more reliable than any supernatural or pseudoscientific understanding. But it also is a brilliant instructional for becoming a skeptical thinker. How to construct, understand, read and recognize valid and invalid arguments to ultimately arrive at truth while minimizing bias. Sagan gives the reader a nine-step baloney detection kit, explains logical fallacies, and shows how and where science has been misused and why those misuses don't invalidate the field altogether. The Demon Haunted World was published in 1995 and has had an enduring legacy ever since. Another Malcolm Gladwell I want to add to this list is Outliers, The Story of Success. This is another one I read via audiobook, but there wasn't necessarily an advantage to that format in this case. This book is one I wish would become required reading for every high school or secondary school age student, although adults can absolutely benefit as well. It's all about, as the subtitle suggests, success why those at the very top of their fields made it there, but it has a different take than you might think. It's broken down into two parts, opportunity and legacy, and looks at many specific examples, from the Beatles to Bill Gates, trying to establish what takes someone from a talented achiever to a statistical anomaly. I can't say this one affected my day-to-day -day behavior as much as the previous few, but it certainly gave me new context in which to see the world and see successful people. And perhaps if I had read it at an earlier age, it may have had an even greater effect. Nevertheless, another worthy Gladwell read. Finally, a book I have recommended ad nauseum in my personal life, but haven't mentioned on here in a while, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. Depending on where you are, the subtitle is either The New Science of Sleep and Dreams or Unlocking the Power of Sleep and Dreams. This is another one I have both in physical form and audiobook, although I first experienced it as an audiobook, again, read by the author. Now, Matthew Walker has done many interviews, presentations, and even a masterclass on masterclass.com involving the research presented in this book. But the book is still probably going to be the most thorough presentation of the information. And it is because of this book I absolutely prioritize my sleep. Essentially, until the last 20 odd years or so, scientists really didn't understand sleep. Why it was necessary, what exactly happens while we sleep, nothing. 
We've all certainly been told sleep is important, but this research really shows just how insanely important it is and how sleep affects literally every aspect of our life, from our focus and attention to our body's ability to fight cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, and many more. One thing that still stands out in my mind from reading this book is the study on daylight savings time. Daylight savings time has given us by far the most expansive global study on the effect of just one more or one fewer hour of sleep can have on us. In the spring, when we lose an hour of sleep, there is a 24% increase in heart attacks. Whereas in autumn, when we gain an hour, there is a 21% reduction in heart attacks. And the results are similar in other areas such as road traffic accidents, strokes, and even downturns in the stock market. However, even just a little extra sleep can provide immediate benefits. While I still don't always get it right, this book has influenced me to make sure my sleep is not only long enough, but as regular as I can get it, going to bed and waking up at the same time every day. I've also almost entirely cut out caffeine and greatly reduced my alcohol intake as a result of this book. Something I'm sure is a deal breaker for a lot of people, but honestly, just give it a try and see how you feel. At the end of the book, Walker also gives several methods to help you sleep better. Depending on your outlook and personal situation going into this book, I can see how it could feel both depressing and uplifting, but for me personally, just knowing I could take control of one thing, my sleep, and therefore take better control of so many aspects of my life simply as a result was very empowering. Before I wrap up this video, I want to give an honorable mention to one author, the British mentalist and illusionist Darren Brown. In addition to his performing career, he is also a fantastic writer and has written a few books that, while they didn't make this list, still had an impact on me. The first one is Tricks of the Mind, which covers multiple different fields including performance magic, faith healing, skepticism, and psychological manipulation. This book really led me to want to pursue more literature in these fields and is a great one to grab your attention. He also did a lot of research into the concept of happiness throughout human history and how modern self-help books often cause more damage than one starts out with going into them, which is reflected in happy and in the shorter form a little happier. He's written a bunch of other books as well, but I wanted to briefly mention those two as ones I thoroughly enjoyed and benefited from. Darren Brown also narrates his own audiobooks, by the way, and he's lovely to listen to. Happy is one I partly read and partly audiobooked, but I've also audiobooked some others of his. If you have read a book that has changed your life for the better, particularly nonfiction, as I'm kind of in a mood for that at the moment, please let me know your recommendations in the comments. Also, if you have read any of these and can lend any further comment to them, feel free to do so. A big thank you to my current 5,888 subscribers, as well as all other fellow bookworms, collectors, and nerdy human beings watching, and anyone joining in from the future. Also, if you enjoy my content and wish to see more of it, you can support my channel by leaving me a one-off tip at ko-fi.com slash squirrelynerdyjess, buy me a caffeine-free cuppa, or leave me a super thanks here on YouTube. There is absolutely no pressure to do either of these, but it does help me to carve out time to learn, create, and share more free content with you. Until next time, be kind, be curious, be authentic, and effective. Bye! Hello beautiful bookworms, Squirrely Nerdy Jess here. That's my awkward intro of the shot. Hope and direction. Ugh. Even if we're a physical and empathetic than short form content, I can almost get there. Make us more <laughs> and nox than short term form. Why do I make that sound? Communication and miscommunication. Do, 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 do. Oh, I almost had that. It's a lot of big words. Who read all those big words? I should fire my writer. Which is me, by the way. We need detection. <laughs> Statistical anomaly. 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 That the last word. I got the last. Okay, it's fine. One for the bloopers.